Welcome to this presentation on equitable photoplethysmography in wearables. I'm from the UK and in the UK, a country of approximately 70 million people, it's thought that around 400,000 people live with undiagnosed atrial fibrillation. 1.4 million people live with undiagnosed obstructive sleep apnea and over 5 million people have undiagnosed hypertension. So there's potentially great benefit to identifying the early signs of these diseases. Wearables such as smartwatches provide opportunity to monitor physiology in daily life and potentially detect these diseases earlier and at scale. To introduce myself, my name's Peter Charlton. I'm a researcher at the University of Cambridge and at City University of London. At the start of my working life, I was based on the intensive care unit at St Thomas's Hospital in London, where we were trying to take the technology used in bedside monitors on the intensive care unit out into wearables for use on the wards. Today, I focus more on the wearables worn in daily life, such as this wristband. In the year since our son in this picture was born, we had our second child. And uh, soon after he was born, I was left uh, looking after him um, with uh, what I thought was minimal supervision and little idea of what to do next. He did have a pulse oximeter attached, but I was a little bit skeptical of the accuracy of the heart rate provided by pulse oximeters on newborn infants. And perhaps it's this that has, uh, in part, motivated my interest in equity. The World Health Organization has defined equity as the absence of unfair, avoidable or remediable differences among groups of people. Just to unpack that, unfair can be defined as without favoritism or discrimination, remediable, capable of being corrected. And the World Health Organization go on, goes on to describe groups of people typically defined by their characteristics. When we think about photoplethysmography signal processing, we can think of examples of how inequity might appear. So perhaps unfairness might be due to training an algorithm on a select group without accounting for other groups. Um, perhaps we could avoid using a suboptimal algorithm when other algorithms would perform better across groups. And maybe um, an example of a remediable situation is specifying constants in an algorithm which are not suitable across all groups. Take the fundamental task of detecting heartbeats in a PPG signal. Here we have a PPG signal from an adult with a heart rate of about 97 beats per minute. And here is a, a neonatal PPG signal with a much higher heart rate of 150 beats per minute. One of the algorithms that we studied included an assumption about a typical heart rate, which was very close to that shown by the adult in this signal, uh, but is quite a long way away from the heart rate of 150 shown by the neonate. And indeed, when we assessed the performance of this algorithm, we found that uh, it performed better in adults than neonates. So how might one address this potential inequity? Uh, well, to address unfairness, could we improve performance by retraining on diverse subjects? Could an alternative algorithm provide better performance across different groups? Or could we improve performance across groups by modifying this constant? Let's start with this last example. So if we modify this constant from 90 to I don't know, double it, 180. Then we find looking at the second set of box plots that indeed the performance on neonates is increased by modifying this assumption. 
Note that there is still a difference between adults and neonates. How about uh, using an alternative algorithm? Well, if we use an alternative high performance algorithm, then similarly, we can um, improve the performance on neonates. But yet the difference still persists. There are many, many factors which contribute to equity. And I myself have worked most with only two of these factors, the performance of wearables and the acceptability of wearables. So I'll focus on these in this presentation. Firstly, I'll give an introduction to wearables. Then I'll outline some of our contributions. And finally, give some closing perspectives. So firstly, an introduction to wearables. Wearables come in all sorts of form factors. So hopefully there is one that might be suitable for a group of interest. Some of the key signals measured by wearables are as follows. Firstly, the ECG signal, a measure of the heart's electrical activity. It clearly shows QRS complexes corresponding to heartbeats, so it can be used to estimate heart rate and potentially to diagnose arrhythmias. It's traditionally measured using a 12 lead ECG machine in a clinical setting, but recently smartwatches and other devices have gained the functionality of being able to record a single lead ECG. A second signal measured by wearables is the accelerometry signal. A measure of acceleration, this signal shows movement. Also measured by fitness trackers, it can be used to estimate step counts. And thirdly, the signal that I'll focus on today, the photoplethysmogram or PPG, exhibits a pulse wave for each heartbeat, and so can be used to estimate heart rate and to identify an irregular pulse. Just to look in a bit more detail at the PPG signal. Here we have a wrist-worn PPG sensor, and taking a cross section through the wrist, we can see how the sensor works. It shines a light onto the skin, and the amount of light reflected back is measured by a photodiode. This produces a time varying signal, a photoplethysmogram with a pulse wave for each heartbeat. There shown for 100 beats per minute and here shown at 80 beats per minute. And finally, here's an example collected during atrial fibrillation, where both the interbeat intervals and the pulse wave amplitudes vary from one beat to the next. Taking a closer look at an individual pulse wave, Pulse waves contain a wealth of information on the cardiovascular systems, as shown by all of the features on this pulse wave. And indeed, as the cardiovascular properties change with age, we see marked differences here between the shapes of finger PPG signals. Here are some ideas for further reading if you want to find out more about wearable photoplethysmography. So some of our contributions. Well, uh, my current work focuses on detecting atrial fibrillation. And it's thought that if atrial fibrillation was adequately diagnosed and treated in England alone, then this would save 2,000 lives per year. It would prevent 7,000 strokes and result in an additional 425,000 diagnoses. It's particularly important to look for atrial fibrillation in older adults because the incidence of AF increases with age. It's also important to try to detect it in daily life because AF can occur only infrequently. However, not everyone has a smartwatch, particularly older adults. So an alternative approach to using consumer devices is to provide devices such as through a screening program we're currently running the Safer Wearables study, a study aiming to assess the performance and acceptability of wearables for detecting atrial fibrillation. We're intending to recruit 130 older adults aged 65 and over, half of whom have been diagnosed with AF, and asking participants to wear free wearable devices for a week. Two wrist-worn devices shown on the left, one similar in form factor to a smartwatch, one a wristband, and then also a reference ECG chest patch. 
At the end of the week, we asked participants to complete a questionnaire to let us know how they found wearing the devices. And here are some initial results from the first 21 participants. The headline message is that the vast majority of participants said they would be happy to wear these devices for a week if they were regularly used to check people's health. However, when we look in a bit more detail, we see that um, a reasonable proportion of participants said that the chest patch potentially was uncomfortable. And in particular, said that the sticky dots, i.e. the electrodes, bothered them. There are a range of responses. So on the one hand, uh, someone said that they forgot that the chest patch was there. And on the other, a participant said it looked as though they'd been attacked with an octopus with a round ring. So there's a need to try and cater for um, this range of experience amongst potential wearable users. That focused on assessing the acceptability of wearables. And now, as we work towards assessing their performance for detecting atrial fibrillation, one of the first steps in that process is to identify individual heartbeats in the signal from which to extract interbeat intervals. So we set out to identify the best algorithm to detect heartbeats in PPG signals. We assessed the performance of 15 open source beat detection algorithms against reference ECG derived heartbeat labels. And we assessed them across eight data sets, which produced a set of results looking like this, where each panel shows performance either on a data set or an activity from within a data set. So for instance, here we have the algorithms on the x-axis and then their performance on the y-axis. Looking at the performance at rest, i.e. in the absence of movement, several beat detectors performed well with F1 scores of over 90%. During exercise, the performance was poorer with lower F1 scores. And in addition, when we look at the performance in different subgroups, we observe some differences. And um, so comparing subjects with AF compared to non-AF, we observe that for many beat detectors, performance is poorer in AF. Similarly, moving to the middle plot, um, for many beat detectors, performance was poorer in neonates than adults. And then moving to the right-hand plot, uh, we did observe some differences in performance between uh, subjects with black and white listed as their ethnicity, um, but these weren't significant after correction for multiple comparisons. Perhaps the results might be different on other data sets. We were able to conclude which two algorithms we thought performed best, although this is somewhat subjective. A promising potential use of photoplethysmography is to detect an irregular pulse and to prompt the user to then take a single EDCG. And whilst uh, this diverges slightly from the topic of photoplethysmography, you might be interested to know that we've recently performed a similar study of ECG beat detection algorithms, where similarly, in this case, here we have data sets on the x-axis and algorithms on the y-axis, and we assessed their performance here on ECG data collected under clinical supervision, here on telehealth ECG data, where performance was lower, again, a different telehealth ECG data set, and finally, on low quality data, where performance was even lower. Previously, I've looked at estimating respiratory rate from PPG signals. And this became even more important during the COVID-19 pandemic because it was observed that an elevated respiratory rate was associated with diagnosis of COVID-19, intensive care admission with COVID-19 and death in hospital with COVID-19. So it looked as though it could be helpful to monitor respiratory rate in daily life to pick up the early signs of COVID-19. Algorithms to estimate respiratory rate from 
PPG signals using classical signal processing work as follows. And here I'll demonstrate it on a synthetic PPG signal at the top, and then signals modulated in three different ways by breathing, baseline wonder, amplitude modulation, and frequency modulation. Firstly, fiducial points are identified on the signals, and these are used to extract features such as the baseline, amplitudes, and intervals. These can be used to obtain surrogate respiratory signals, where ideally each signal shows a peak for each breath. And then for each of these signals, respiratory rate can be estimated either in the time domain on the left or the frequency domain on the right. Having obtained these individual estimates, one from each modulation, one can then fuse these estimates. So here the fused value shown in blue, simply found as the average, is closer to the reference than the individual estimates. We looked at different techniques for each of these stages and tried algorithms consisting of different combinations of techniques. We considered lots of different algorithms and identified what we thought was the winning combination on young subjects. It wasn't until about a year later when we looked at the uh, modulations in further depth where we found that the strength of the modulations differed between young and older adults. So in particular, the baseline wonder and the amplitude modulations were almost the same between these two groups, but the frequency modulation differed greatly. It was less strong in older adults. So for this reason, we decided to modify our algorithm to ensure that it was still performing well in older adults by only using the first two modulations and not using that third one. Some perspectives to close with. There are many, many potential sources of inequity for wearables, and the paper listed here provides several examples. In this presentation, I've only covered two. I also think that it's worth thinking about equity in academic research and the potential role of open science in this. In my academic role, I value sharing our work. For example, we provide open source toolboxes of algorithms, such as our toolbox of respiratory rate algorithms. And over time, we learn how to improve our processes. We realized in retrospect that this toolbox wasn't very easy to use, in part because each algorithm wasn't contained within a single function, but was spread across multiple functions. We're learning how to improve things all the time. So in our more recent toolbox of PPG beat detection algorithms, we have kept individual algorithms in individual functions. However, this is still in a programming language that uses proprietary software. And so we do hope to transition to Python in the near future. Indeed, uh, some of our work already uses Python, such as the Py PPG toolbox, which we developed recently. We also aim to provide open data sets where possible, such as this PulseWave database shown here. And all of this contributes to enabling others to reproduce and build on our research. We pro provide instructions of how to reproduce our research where possible. And finally, I'd like to provide educational resources where we can to give beginners an introduction to the fundamentals of signal processing. This is all within uh, open access publishing, and here's an example of where we weren't allowed to publish open access. So instead, we made efforts to provide the accepted manuscripts so that people could still access this work free of charge. Sometimes I'm asked, what algorithm would you use? And in the case of PPG beat detection, uh, there were two leading contenders from our study but they have different pros and cons, so I struggle to answer that question. One, for instance, um, is highly efficient, but is under a license which isn't often suitable for commercial use. The other is under a more permissive license, 
but is less efficient. So one piece of work we're doing at the moment is to develop um, an implementation of this uh, algorithm, which is more efficient and therefore hopefully suitable for use by a wider audience. And here we're aiming to make this an open source algorithm that's easy to use in a free to use programming language to design it using open data sets, provide instructions for how to reproduce the research, maybe include it in educational resources. And of course, this will all, all be available in open access publications. During this talk, I haven't mentioned pulse oximetry, and there's been uh, research in recent years demonstrating the difference in accuracy of pulse oximetry across different skin tones, which has now uh, been the subject of uh, further discussion and review. And this is a particularly important issue for our field to cover. I myself haven't worked on it closely, which is why I haven't discussed it further. So with that, I'd like to thank my colleagues, institutions and funders, and many, many more than on this slide, and conclude by saying, photoplephysmography is now widely used in wearable devices with many potential applications. Photoplephysmography-based wearables have shown great promise in certain applications, such as detecting atrial fibrillation. However, there's much work to do to ensure the potential benefits of photoplephysmography are available to all, making photoplephysmography-based devices as reliable as a climbing rope. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, point you towards the slides, and uh, I always welcome people getting in touch. Thank you.